um, you've seen that on the map before, um, the location, the request, and what the subcommittees um, recommended. Um, there are a few of them that have not been reviewed by the subcommittee. The um, request was um, brought forth after that particular subcommittee area had closed. And then if there is time after that, we will go over um, some recommendations that were made for the um, high density residential areas to comply with the housing element. So I'm going to stop sharing that. And then I will share another document with you. Okay, can you see that? Do I need to enlarge that a little? A little bit. Okay. A little bit more? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Thank you. There. Okay. Is that visible? Yes. Okay. If I could interrupt briefly, um, mm -hmm. Tim on Durko just joined the meeting. So Tim is here. Okay. So land use change request number one is um, two parcels and they're located adjacent to the Green Business Park application, the BEM site um, along Bankhead Road. And I'll, I'm just going to scroll down here really quick. So you can see it's um, these parcels, there's a little piece right here and then here's the remainder of the parcel over here. So here's Sierra College Boulevard and Bankhead coming this way. Um, so this request is by the property owner, um, the Millers, and they would like to um, reinstate their original request. They had um, taken it, withdrawn it for a, a period, but now they would like to uh, pursue it again. So um, this request is to go from RE to RA. Um, there, the surrounding land uses are RE to the north and east and RA to the west. And then Rockland is to the south. Um, since this was rescinded <clears throat> previously, the subcommittee did not um, look at it. So now you are being asked to look at it and uh, make a um, decision. And for the committee's benefit, I have um, Ray and Alina Miller, the property owners of this site, um, on the line to discuss what they're trying to accomplish. I agree. Okay, so Christy, um, what is the what is the protocol here? Should we let the owners talk to us about their reasoning and then go back to us? Uh, is that what your plan is? Yes, that would be, now is an appropriate time unless anyone has any other questions, but I think letting them speak would be a good idea. And then Perfect. we can ask questions after. Thank you. Then go ahead and, you know, for all of the land requests, please go ahead and do that. That's what's wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Um, Ray and Alina, you can unmute. Mary Beth, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so th this is Ray Miller at 3996 Bankhead Road. Um, yeah, we're requesting to have our, our zoning change back to the 4.6, which it used to be at one time. For, for, for a long time, it was 4.6. And we've decided we have no, no uh, possibility, no you know ideas of developing. We would like to keep our animal keeping, farming, we've, we've raised hay, we've done farming, and we'd like to go back to the 4.6 agricultural the way it used to be and, and keep that. And so we can protect our uses that we've, we've been here for 47 years and would like to just keep it just the way it is. Okay, 
Thank you. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions for Mr. Miller? And it looks like Tim has his hand up. This is a, yeah, thank you, Jan. Uh, this is a question of staff. Um, by changing it back to RA, I mean, how does that, are they, are they currently unable to use the property in its current, in its current use uh, and not the way they want to use it? I, I, I guess I'm just confused. Like if they go back to 4.6, why does that, what does that allow them to do all of a sudden that they're not able to do right now? Uh, the one thing that um, the, the transfer from RA to RE um, didn't change anything of their RA use on that property. The only thing that would change that is any kind of um, action to change the use on the property. And then it would, have to be to the RE standards. So as long as they didn't do anything there or change anything, um, the grandfathered RA comes forward. Um, so at this time, they just want to go back to where they were and not have to worry about the RE. I, under, I understand what, hang on here. Um, I, I understand what they are saying, uh, you know, by changing the, the, uh, the the lot minimum back to 4.6, but how does, what, what she's asked, which, what, what Ray is saying is that they wanna be able to go back to their prior use uh, of the property. I'm just curious, what can't they do now that they could otherwise do before? They can't, right now they can continue to do what they've done over the last 40 years. Um, in the last general plan update, um, they felt that there might be a benefit to go to the RE, but at this time they realized, yeah, maybe that wasn't a good deal, a, a good decision, and they'd like to revisit going back to RA at this time. Mary Beth, can I say something? You go ahead, Ray. Okay, yeah, one of our concerns is we would like to put it, because we're using it for agricultural, we have and we continue to do that. Um, in regards to building some uh, animal structures like an indoor riding arena and hay covered storage, we want to be able to do that agricultural type buildings. And then the other thing is that depending on what happens around us, we're really concerned of, you know, the, de the development on each side, what's going to happen. And, and it's my understanding that with the 4.6 that uh, whoever buys the properties around us would have to be notified of our existing uses and we would be able to keep those uses. And that, that's, that's our main concern. I see. I'm, I'm sorry to just keep asking questions on this, but so are you unable to, to uh, this again, a question staff, but are, are they unable to, to construct like agricultural uh, structures under its existing use? Yes. They are able. So I guess I'm just confused to why they, other than what might happen around them, th there's no change in the ability to use the property for what they're currently using it for. If they go, if they go back to 4.6, nothing changes, right? I mean, with, with their ability to use it for what they're currently using it for, right? Well, well one, one of our major concerns is what is going to happen around us. Uh, you know, obviously that's a concern. Well, we were right. we were told that we were a, we were grandfathered in from the four point six, but that we would have to keep everyone or anyone who was to purchase around us notified. Um, I don't want to have to to do that. Um, we were also told unless there was a name change on the property, that would include um, our daughter. So that we would be grandfathered in until there was a name change. There's, um, when looking at the building structures, it was my understanding that by having the 2.3, you're only allowed like certain sizes for things versus agricultural. So, I mean, I, I may not be correct on that, but that's how I was reading it. So those were some of the things that we were concerned with. I don't have to look over my shoulder. I just want to live my life, continue it, and move on. Right. Okay. 
All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Jean Wilson, am I unmuted? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so for clarification then, I, I was wondering about what happens when they sell the property or uh, one of their kids inheritance because to what extent are things that are grandfathered in to the Millers right now, do those continue? So that's one question. And the other one is, I wasn't sure about your answer on the structures. Generally, if things are grandfathered in, you can't increase the, the use, you can't in increase what you're doing. So would they not, under that kind of provision, would they not be allowed to increase, um, you know, to build more structures and make it more intensive use, that sort of thing. That would, I think that's one of their concerns. And what is the total acreage for the two parcels? It's 20.2 acres. One, one parcel is 19.8 and the other one is uh, approximately 0.625. So, so I'm going to go ahead and answer part of that, Jean. Um, okay. when, you look, when you look at the RE and the RA allowed uses, um, there is next to nothing that they do there that is a grandfathered in. If you look at animal keeping, animal keeping rules are the exact same for an RE as they are for RA. Um, they're both allowed um, livestock. They're both allowed horses. Um, where the number comes into is their, their number of animals is dependent on the number of acres they have because the zoning rules are exactly the same. As far as structures on a property, um, like ag structures and that kind of stuff, um, again, none of that is grandfathered in. Um, where, the, where it comes into zoning issues would be, we would look at total lot coverage and what, what are they doing as far as lot coverage? Um, how much physical space are they taking? Riding arenas are allowed in both locations, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really just a matter of, of, of um, so I think it's just important to know that most of what they have there is not grandfathered in. It's legally allowed by the zoning rules. RE rules are very, very similar, even when it comes to ag use, because they're both considered ag use properties. Um, I could certainly understand their desire to go back to what they were, but as far as, I just think it's really important to know that um, even changing names, selling it, a lot of that is not going to go away because they're, zone, they're legally zoned, allowed to do ag use um, and where the, where the notifying of neighbors is, it's going to be for a, if a developer comes in, they're going to have to, to know that um, they do livestock because a neighbor that comes in and on any of the neighboring properties on that neighbor, the Miller's property or anybody else's, um, what the millers do is allowed by the zoning. And we, the purpose of notifying neighbors is so that they do, not, they, have, they do not have the right to come back and say, kind of like the people who buy next to an airport and then complain about the noise. People who come and buy next to a rural property that does livestock, they, um, they, they do not have, in, we notify them so that they come in knowing they cannot request that the millers change the use of their property. Oh, I don't, I don't have my chart in front of me right now. What are the uses that are allowed in RA that are not allowed in RE? Let's say for their kids or somebody else that buys it and wanted to do something. What, what are the things that are not allowed in RE that are in RA? Right. Give me just a second here because I actually have the chart up on my computer. So give me just a second. I can just kind of see ag use what. Um, I, I have it right here, Carol. Oh, perfect. Okay. And Christy, this will stop your screen share for a moment. Sure. Okay. <coughs> so these are the RE and RAs, the RAs and REs, and all the things that you can do. 
So as far as animal keeping, um, it requires a special permit and then that attaches to this code. Uh, let me go to that because I think that kind of drills down more on the uh, nuts and bolts of animal keeping. So here again, you have the RA and the RE, you get down to permitted uses of hogs and swine, horses and cows, household pets, large animals, rabbits, small animals, worm farming, all is permitted uses. And then it, that one footnote in that one, uh, small animals, just see for the definition of small and large animals. Uh, trying to get this all on one screen here. So hogs and Beth, swine. Could you, zoom, could you zoom out just a little bit? Zoom out. No. No, the other way. Zoom out. Oh, that's a little better. Thank you. Appreciate it. Is that too small? That's perfect for me, but... Um, Okay, I still have to slide over. So in this category, it's 12 um, animals per acre, minimum lot areas, uh, property line setbacks. So that was for fowl and poultry. Uh, horses and cows is on this line here. two per acre and one per, what a minimum one acre lot size. So those are all the same, it looks like. Yeah, they're all the same. And then there's things about noise control and um, animal husbandry on site and things like that. Large animals, six per acre on a half acre minimum lot size, and then your setbacks. Okay, so it looks like there's absolutely really, there's no difference. Exactly. Okay, and I think Ramona has had her hand up and I think somebody else might have too, but Ramona? Yeah, so, um, Understanding that from the point of use and permitted uses and allowed uses, since it is very, it, in essence, is the same to res, res ag and res estate. Um, I think what I'm hearing from the property owner, if I am not wrong, is that their interest is to go back to the res ag at 4.6 minimum more as a, uh, that, that they feel that they'd be, their, their farm operations would be more secure and more safeguarded um, because the subdivision of land away from 4.6 to a smaller possibility of res estate might be what is the way I'm kind of viewing it is that they're, they're, they're concerned about protecting their agricultural operation or the, you know, the potential for um, agriculture on their land and having it revert back to a uh, designation that is more agricultural in name um, and maybe not so much in nature considering that our particular town allows you you know this is essence the same uses in both the designations um, that's the way I'm seeing it. and I can certainly appreciate that um, especially if they're you know thinking of that the property will then at some point maybe uh, somewhat in the somewhat near future change hands either um, as a sale or inheritance. So I can appreciate that um, myself as being someone who owns a, a farm on 4.6 acres um, to have that designation state agriculture. 
Thank you. Mary Beth, if I can make a comment when it's appropriate. Yeah, Please. go ahead, Ray. Yeah, she's 100% right. And that's really what it's all about is to try to keep the development at bay. You know, we've had the property for a long time. We have our uses and we like to, to be able to stay that way. That, that, that's what it's all about. And Ramona was 100% right. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Randy has his hand up. Yes, I agree with, with what Ray said and um, Ramona. Uh, I, I see no reason why not to uh, go ahead and honor his request to go back to RA. Okay, is there anybody else on in our committee that has any questions for Ray? Or a our question. Jean, I have a question for Ray. Um, now, if, if you do this at some future time, you would have more problem to, to divide the parcels. Is that a concern of yours? In other words, if you go back to RA, you can't split it into as many. Um, is that a concern or you, that's fine with you just to-, to no, no, that, that, at, parcels, this, so. at this point, that is fine with me. And, and part of that decision, just so you know, and, and that I, I've thought through that a lot. And one of the original goals was that maybe at some point divide that into 2.3s. For one thing, we've decided we don't want to go nowhere. We have no intentions of developing it, you know, to the 2.3s. And then really sitting down and evaluating my piece of property. Uh, we have decided that if it was ever to be developed up the way the lay of the land is, and with the drainage that comes through on all our property, uh, the 4.6 uh, would be the best use for it. Do you have any other questions for him, Jean? No, that's fine. Okay, anybody else? Madam Chair, I just have a member of the public with their hand raised. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Ryan's, you may unmute. Hey, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Joe Ryan. Uh, I live at 3995 Bankhead, which is directly across the street from the Miller's property. Um, I was just hoping to make a couple comments, and I certainly can't speak on behalf of Ray Alina and their child. Um, but in my time living here, I've come to appreciate the uh, historical and emotional significance that the Millers have towards the animals on their property. Um, they've got a beautiful piece of property. They've got uh, amazing animals over there, and we're very fortunate that we actually get to kind of stare at them throughout the day. Um, I've talked to Ray multiple times, and he's, he's <laughs> talked about how he has no interest uh, in selling the property, but eventually it would likely go to his daughter. Um, I know her and she has very similar interests. She's a horse person, as I call them. I moved from the city. So I guess that's uh, something I got to get up to speed with. Um, however, I know that she would love to have horses and have the ability uh, to maintain that in her future ownership. And in the event she weren't in a position where she could uh, take care of the entirety of the property, if it were to be in a 4.6 allocation, uh, she could potentially sell off several of the lots while maintaining a 4.6 parcel for herself. Uh, that would allow her to uh, enjoy the animals that she's had her entire life, and that would allow her to surround herself with neighbors who share similar interests. Um, I would also just like to, to say that uh, in my time looking at these or listening to these meetings, it seems like it's very difficult to upsize your lots because it seems to be the theme is to downsize, as we're going to be talking about later with high density housing. Um, so I think that uh, especially if it's the property owner that's requesting this and they've had it for nearly half of a decade, I think it would just be appropriate to honor their request um, as they have been longstanding members of, of the, uh, uh, the township. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Anybody else? Mary Beth? Nobody else? Um, Miguel Yukovich, go ahead. Hi, thank you. I would... 
strongly recommend going with the uh, property owner's recommendation. 4.6 keeps it very rural and um, in keeping with the theme of the town. So I would strongly recommend going with the 4.6 zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Ramona has her hand up again. Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. And if you look at the map, overall map, that it it's not, uh, the parcel changing to RA would also make sense in a consistency matter to me at least that um, the adjacent property right to the west of it, if I'm looking at the map correctly, is RA. And both of those parcels are at the very edge of town at the town limits. So um, that seems to be consistent too that you know, we, we've tried as much as we can to keep the edges of our town zoned with larger acreage lots. So even though north of it would be RE zoning, um, it, to me, it seems that it's not, you're not getting yourself into a super consistency issue of zoning something that's not um, with adjacent, uh, similar adjacent zoning, or I should say land use technology, not zoning. Okay, thank you, Ramona. All right, committee members. It looks like Tim has his hand up. One more question. Uh, staff, can you tell us if this has any impact on our housing element at all? This uh, change to the zoning? No. Mm -hmm. Go it ahead, Mark. It doesn't impact the housing element, but it does impact SB 330 that talks about no net loss. So what we would need to do is demonstrate that we have four additional units elsewhere in the town so that they could replace the theoretical four that might have been here. Um, pretty clear from the discussion, it was never going to happen, but unfortunately, that's the way the state law is written. Um, not the end of the world, we just, it's just another thing we'd have to figure out. But this isn't a housing element site. It was never shown for high density. It's, it doesn't meet any of the criteria. So the, the short answer is nope, doesn't affect the housing element at all. The long answer is at the end of our meeting and when we get to the final end of this, we just have to have a tally of making sure we have enough housing to make sure we have no net loss. That's all. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. No other questions, Jan. Thanks. Okay. So Mark, um, I hate to kind of bring this back up again, but I do want everybody to understand what you're saying is um, we would need to come up with four additional housing spots, um, um, not because of the housing element, but that our number would increase. Is that what you're saying? That uh, we would have to find four more units somewhere else. We just have to show that mathematically we haven't lost the potential for housing. Yes. And how would we do that? Well, in some cases, we may be changing land use designations to increase uh, density. We can certainly rely on that. So, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to balance the entire general plan on on this one decision. Um, we just figured we'd keep a tally of the recommended decisions for the committee and then figure it out when we're done because it could be that later on you decide something goes the other direction and which would take over I mean, four units as minuscule right. uh, in the overall scheme of things. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a question? And then um, Christy, how do we, do we need to make a motion or what is your, what is your preference for um, getting a re resolution on this? We'll need some sort of vote. Okay, and but Beth, I see she has her hand up. Beth? Um, so you said we need to make up four un housing units, which I understand going from RE to RA requires that um, across the 20 acres. But our existing general plan from 2001, what, what were these designated then wasn't it ra was this a recent change so maybe the four units are actually negligible they they don't count it doesn't matter what was done originally it's what's on the ground today i think this did happen at the last general plan update is that right ray yes yes it did mm -hmm. but in terms of in terms of SB 330, it matters what, hap what 
what the general plan land use designation was if on January 1st of 2020, not previous to when the general plan was adopted last time. Okay. Does that satisfy your questions, Beth? Okay. So um, no motion is needed, Christy? Just a vote? I think we, I would like to hear a motion and then vote because you're making a recommendation to change the land use element. So I would, I think a motion is appropriate and a vote. Okay. Jean here, I move that we approve the uh, land change request of the Alinas for their properties on uh, at 3996 and 3994 Bankhead Road. I second that. Okay, roll call, please. Just, just confirming, was that Randy that I heard? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Jean Wilson? Yes. Randy Elder? Yes. Jan Clark Kretz? Yes. Bonnie London? Yes. Tim Andurko? Yes. Beth Cohen? Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay, then moving along. So site two, um, this is in the limited industrial area along Sweatzer Road. This was um, a suggestion by a non-owner um, concerned with the uh, noise impacts in that area. Um, the subcommittee recommended no change because it, the concern was really a zoning issue. Um, and this is the area we're talking about. So this is all of the industrial and uh, light industrial areas. And is um, any member of the public here or representing is Eva here? No? No. Okay. And there was no recommendation for any particular change. Again, it was pretty much related to reviewing the, the code and seeing what is allowed or what is not allowed. Right. And I, I know I was, I remember that meeting because we did say that we would follow up uh, with the allowable uses in the zoning code um, after the general plan was updated and that those notes are going to be moved forward. Correct? Correct. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this one? I think that was the correct, uh, the, the correct interpretation of what we should do was to, to move it forward into the, um, the zoning, zoning ordinance when that gets reviewed so that we could look carefully and see if all the things that are listed there are still appropriate. For instance, one of mine, my concerns was, should we really be allowing uh, shooting ranges and some other noisy things there? And so I think that it does need to be reviewed, but this is not the place. So I, I think we should just leave it as is. Anybody else have any comments or questions? Uh, Tim. Uh, thanks, Jan. I don't, uh, I don't support a change here. I'd like to keep it uh, as the existing, uh, with the existing language. Thank you. Any members of the public? Okay, so in this case, um, Anders, do you still need a motion or how do you? So I think in this case, uh, it's a consensus of the committee and we uh, move it forward in that way. I, it, it's only where we're making a recommendation for a change that I believe a motion uh, is required. All right, uh, committee members, is there anybody that would not, would, is there anybody that doesn't agree with this? So in other words, um, by us not having any opinion, it would just fall to following up after the general plan is updated. If anybody's disagreeing about that, now's the time to let me know. So if nobody does, we'll move on. Okay. No change then. All right. And moving along. Um, Site three, the, this is along King Road. I'll move to the map so you can see. So this is at the corner of King and Switzer. the site right here. 
Um, so it's a vacant parcel and the request is by the property owner to change it from general commercial to light or limited industrial. And the subcommittee recommended to change it from general commercial to light industrial. And that was reviewed by both the Sierra College Boulevard subcommittee and the business corridor subcommittee. Okay, is it anybody representative of that property here tonight? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about this change? Anybody, members of the public? Well, the, oh, okay. yes. yes, Beth, yeah. go ahead. Um, when I listened in on that subcommittee meeting, I thought they asked um, staff to follow up with the surrounding um, uh, business park over there. Uh, I think there's like a, a couple of um, like a Chinese restaurants, a few restaurants over there um, to find out, I guess, their inputs on it. So one, I'm wondering if that ever happened. And then two, um, I am curious how long the, the, the people that are interested in that, how long they've been in business, um, and whether or not this is just like flash of the pan kind of concept, or have they been outgrowing for 20 years and this is a, a long-term owner kind of problem? Those are my two questions about that change. It looks like um, they've owned that business for 35 years, according to the request. Um, but then go ahead, staff. I'm sure you have a lot more input insight than I do. They, they have owned that property and they own property within this um, business park area, this industrial park area that they are outgrowing. And so they would like to expand um, so that they're all contained in one site and it's adequate for uh, space for what they are using their existing space for. So it is not um, someone new coming in. They've, they've owned that site and are looking to expand an existing business. And just, Mary, a, just a side note to that, Beth, is they have at, this is not a new request. They've, this is something they have talked about. Um, I've been here for 14 years and they have this, this topic has come up many times with them. So it's definitely not a, a like a, a flash in the pan kind of thing. Mary Beth, did I'm I'm trying to remember um, back to that meeting uh, talking about getting the input from those business owners. Is that something we did follow up on? Or um, no, we did not follow up on that. I, I recall the conversation as the, the commercial next to it um, wouldn't really be impacted by light industrial at that location. And it, the commercial there also provides a buffer between the light industrial and the residential zone on the other side of it. Okay. I have a I have a question. This is Greg. Uh, if you make a, a change like that, do you have to have a notification to the neighbors, just like you do any other, uh, you know, request for a billing permit, et cetera? Yes. Uh, when this goes, it, it, your recommendation will go to the planning commission. Planning commission is going to recommend a draft general plan that will get an EIR. Uh, at that point in time, that becomes official. That's when the notices go out. So all noticing of all property owners adjacent to potential changes will occur at that point in time. And that will be accompanied by an environmental document. Okay. Yeah, I just want to be sure that all the neighboring businesses have opportunity to give input because sometimes these uh, the committees as well as good of a job I think we've done in it is disseminating all this information and notifications. It still doesn't get get two people for whatever reason. Maybe they don't even live in the area. And so official notification would be, uh, I think, important. Yeah, thank you. That answered my question. Thank you, Greg. Anybody else have questions? I can't see all uh, parts. Tim, Tim had his hand raised. I don't know if his question got answered. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, any members of the public? No. 
Oh, perhaps. Uh, calling user, um, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand again. That's negative. Okay. Any other comments from our committee? And, and this would be one we'd want a motion um, because it is a recommendation to make a change. In the, Jean, um, I remember in the discussion, we talked about that it seemed unlikely that that was going to be a good location to develop a commercial there as, as it's currently zoned. And it made more sense to go ahead and, and, um, and put it into the light industrial and, and uh, give this business a chance to expand the way they've been needing to. And also and as a gateway into the industrial area along Switzer. Yeah, this is all light industrial here, and then you have your industrial on this side. All right. I have one public member um, that has a hand raised. I'm not sure who it is, but if you can speak, go ahead. You're muted if you're talking. It's Miguel, so. Oh. I don't see him. Oh, there he is. Go ahead, Miguel. You just Thank unmute. You. Yeah, I, I live just a block away. Um, from this parcel has been sitting there for, I don't know, 40 years, uh, vacant. And there's not any interest in developing it as another shopping center. It's, it's, that's never panned out. And I talked to the owner of Woody's about that parcel um, and he's in favor of having it developed. But anyway, I think it's, it's time that it be go into warehouse use like they want to plan. So I would be totally in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Anybody else? All right then, committee, what is your say? Motion to approve the recommendation on DERCO. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Tim Anderko. Aye. Jen Clark Retz. Aye. Bonnie London. Yes. Jean Wilson. Yes. Beth Cohen. Yes. And Randy Elder. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> On to site four. So this is at 3760 Bankhead Road, um, just south of Saunders. So we're looking here. Um, here's Sierra College Boulevard. So we're just up, up the way from there. Um, this is a request by the property owner. Um, they would like to change this um, from residential estate to rural residential. Um, this particular parcel is surrounded by residential estate in each direction. Um, the subcommittee recommended no change. All right, and is the owner of that parcel here today? No, ma'am. Okay. Committee members, do you have any questions? I like the music interlude. <laughs> Any members of the public have any questions or public comment on this? All right, so Anders, again, we would not need a motion for no change. That's correct, but it'd be good to um, get a consensus of the committee <laughs> that this is what they agree with. Okay, 
All right, so anybody disagree with no change on this? And so then everybody's in agreement that we will recommend no change on this request. Actually, I do have a question. What um, is staff, could you just give us some context to the reasoning behind the subcommittee's recommendation? I mean, um, so there's, is there a current, first of all, is there a current house there or is that a vacant lot? And, or is there, there it looks like there's a house there already. There is a house um, and uh, all these units around it, all these parcels are, are not, um, they're not the, the R -R. R -R that she's looking for, they're RE. Okay. So if we were to do this, it, it would be a spot designation for the general plan and, and the staff has a concern with that. You'd have an island. Yeah. And Bonnie, I requested to, it might be nice for us to be able to look at the, um, the, the map that does show the zoning for the surrounding parcels so that it might be easier to see. <laughs> looking at these. Sure. Let me see if I can, I'll have to switch back and forth. Sorry. Sorry. But, no, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> Okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay. So now we're looking at this, we're looking at this area here. So as you can see in quite a few different directions for quite a ways, it's all RE. Um, not RR. And then the nearest RR would be over here and up here. Where's the property on the, on that map approximately? Christine? So it, it would be right around in here. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. No further questions. Thank Madam you, Tim. Chair. Great. Thank you. And that's really helpful um, to see that map. All right. So back to um, any committee members not in agreement with the no change recommendation. All right, hearing and seeing none. Okay, and we will move along. Uh, map site five was withdrawn, so we will not um, consider that one. Um, number six, uh, the subcommittee recommended no change. This is located at 5150 King Road. Um, it's a change request by the property owner, but um, also a suggestion for other parcels in the vicinity that they do not um, own. And I will show you, this is the area that we're looking at. Um, this request is to change from RE, to a higher density. Um, hang on just a minute. Which would be RR. Yes, yeah, the change is from RE to RR. Sorry, there's so many of these. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm trying to get my head around them all. Um, and then again, this is another one where, let me share back with this. So we're looking at in this area. So um, again, it's mainly RE right here, but there are, we're getting closer to the pockets of RR. So um, this one's a little bit of a challenge because we're not just looking at the landowner's property. It's a suggestion for this entire area. Where's the subject property that the Williams have on that map, Kristen? So, it was a request between two, two of the owners. Hang on. Is this the one where there was a request kind of between two owners because they wanted to, I don't remember, do something, and, but, but there was a way that actually they could do it by just a little bit of a, a land designate, uh, you know, re shifting the lot line a little bit, they could right, do whatever right. it was so they wanted to do. You have the two, two properties, one's coming this way and one is coming down this way. 
And then it would just be a shift between of, of giving up par part of this parcel into this parcel. So if we go back to. And then they could do whatever it was that they'd wanted to do. Yeah. So you're looking at this here. So this is a very long, skinny uh, parcel. And then it, you have this uh, little offset right here where it meets up with this parcel coming down. And so if they did a lot line adjustment to come this way, where my cursor is instead of this way, it would give this person more property. And that was part of part of their request. And did we felt we did we let the owners know? I'm sure we've talked to them about that opportunity that they have that they can do that. And they're not here tonight, are they? Um no. Okay. And Jane to answer your question, Mary Beth sent out correspondence with each of these persons who made the request to let them know tonight was the night to have this happen. So, so let me just repeat what I think I heard. And if I didn't, please correct me, uh, Christy. Um, so if we accept the recommendation to not change anything, can they still achieve what they want to do? if they just do a lot line adjustment? Is that is that what I'm hearing? I think they could, um, not knowing what all they're proposing is there's no application. Um, they, they can do that um, based on what they have requested in their letter. Um, they are just looking to obtain a portion of their neighbor's property with the neighbor wanting to, to sell that to the portion to them. So that would be uh, a lot line adjustment. We wouldn't need to do any um, land use designation change. But another part of this request that was submitted is to change this entire area. Yeah. Well, I, I would say it's pretty drastic to change that entire grid. Um, I, I, I'm not in favor of that. However, I'd, I would support um, uh, uh, an isolated change because there is some uh, some consistent zoning around that area. Also, it's not. Would you would you quote that as spot zoning, um, Anders? Is that, yeah. yeah, yeah. For those for those parcels, yes. Even even though that I mean, one of those parcels does it does, uh, does yeah. It, well, this one's contiguous, or, and and this is sort of contiguous. Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah basically would split it right in the, in the middle that looks pretty spot zoning to me yeah the problem is the island we'd be creating there for the two parcels right that are to the west of, of that where the first is. right right okay well that might not be such a great idea hopefully they can uh, uh, achieve what they want to with this just a minor lot line adjustment um, that seems like it would be ideal. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate it. That's it for me. Yeah, sure. You bet. Anybody else have any questions or members of the public that have a comment? Seeing none. All right. Um, okay. So committee members, it looks like um, no change would be recommended. Um, and if you are not in agreement, now is the time to let me know. It looks like. And, and Jan, at the end of it, just to let you know, we will have a motion on all of these recommendations. So the committee will make that recommendation uh, official with a motion. But okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So shall we move on? Yes. Okay, site seven is at uh, 5500 Barton Road and 5780 Rockland Road. Um, this is located down here. So there's a, a portion of the parcel coming over here and then the remainder is this portion. 
Um, so this request is to change from RA to RR. It's a change request by the property owner and I, that shouldn't say previous. <laughs> <laughs> and the subcommittee recommended no change. And Mary Beth, I believe the representative is here tonight. Yes, we have two representatives here for this project. Um, Kevin Wytrip and I lost her name. Erica. Erica, yes, thank you. <laughs> and they're both uh, been promoted to panelists, so your mics are open, you're free to converse. Hello, thank you. This is Kevin Wytrip. Uh, I decided 4645 Hidden Oaks Lane in Loomis. And I'm here with recently retired school district um, superintendent, Gordon Med. We have uh, Erica, I know, joining in with us as well. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share some information about um, plans for our property. Um, I, I do have uh, some things I can share with you if I can screen share. Uh, Mary Beth, to give you a little vision of what we're talking about tonight, if that would be helpful, or I could just speak to it. No, you can go ahead and share your screen. That that visuals are good. And Erica, your your mic is unmuted, so if you want to join in, you would just unmute your microphone. Thank you. Okay, you see that? Yes, a little bigger. How's that? Yes. Okay, so what we have here is um, just to show you the vicinity of what we're talking about, um, the actual property itself. Um, you can kind of see we're on the southern uh, border of, of town limits down uh, on the corner basically of Rockland Road and Barton Road. Um, we're contiguous to St. Francis Woods um, to the west um, and then uh, Montserrat kind of to the north northeast and the church up on the other corner uh, to the north. Uh, we are requesting tonight um, kind of a unique, uh, we have a unique opportunity in front of us and we recently purchased the property. Um, and before doing so, we're made aware of the fact that the Lumicinian School District had had um, ongoing conversations with uh, previous owners about um, the, a portion of the parcel um, being utilized for a charter school. And we connected with um, Gordon and we entered into a conversation about trying to still preserve that opportunity and what it might take to make that happen. And so that's kind of what we're here tonight to um, talk about. And our request is um, to, to move um, the zoning from rural agricultural to uh, rural residential. Um, this reasoning is uh, allow for both uses still to take place in the property with, with um, some lots for residential use um, that would be sized um, can, can, the same as the contiguous property, for example, St. Francis Woods. Um, there's a large pond and some nice um, features to the property. Um, I'll uh, shift here. Uh, too far in. Uh, let's see. Down, up, down. There we go. Um, you can see uh, the opening here is kind of just say this is a very conceptual first run at what this might look like. Uh, but you can see we have an existing uh, nice feature pond on the um, south east west corner. And our goal would be to try to preserve any of the natural elements on this property as possible. Um, and trees not do any masquerading at all. Um, but between the pond and the natural features and then what we show is a dotted line of what would Um, Kevin, you, um, you uh, looped out there for a little bit. Could you repeat that? Uh-oh. Uh, are we back? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, what I was saying is this this map shows that there um, one of the reasons we're we're having this discussion and making the request is that the upper uh, corner you can see the dotted line now um, lays out about twelve acres of the property that would potentially become the school site. And then we've kind of worked around the natural amenities of the property, um, wanting to preserve as many of those amenities as we can. There will be no mass grading, want to hold on to a lot of the trees, the pond, of course, um, and still try to bring some residential property to, uh, to the site. So this is the blended uh, look at it. Um, we have looked at an overall zoning change to rural residential um, with the ability to give the school uh, district the option to take down those lots that are kind of configured in the upper corner and, and go with the school there. So I can, I want to turn it over to Gordon and let him speak a little Scroll bit to, to the it. school picture. Yeah. Let's go back to one of the conceptual here that's been in, in his, uh, in work for a while on this property long before even we uh, landed on it. So <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you for allowing us to present. Um, one, I wish we had a camera because then you could see what it looks like to be a retired superintendent versus one that's working in the middle of COVID. Um, but thank you so much. Erica Sloan is the new superintendent. She's also uh, on the call. Um, I just wanted to talk through uh, very briefly some of the benefits of this request. Um, and benefits to the Loomis Union School District, first and foremost, is Premier Holmes has agreed to provide us with the acreage we need to relocate the current Loomis Basin Charter School off of the Franklin campus and to this location at a very significantly reduced price. Um, that, that, first of all, is, is, is the first great thing. Secondly, if we can partner with Premier Holmes, we would have tremendous cost savings in our project because we would be... <coughs> we would be sharing costs related to utilities, bringing on the uh, property, the access, infrastructure, uh, all of the in, in infrastructure required and all of the utilities brought onto the site, we would be sharing accordingly. Uh, that, that's again, a, a much reduced cost to the school uh, district. The location is in close proximity to the current location of Loomis Basin Charter which is beneficial to the existing families and doesn't significantly change patterns of traffic or school type challenges. So one of the things this does is, you know, we've been looking for locations for the charter school for about five years now, uh, as Sean and I think some of the council members are aware. Um, and this location in its close proximity keeps kind of that, that school impact down in that location, but it gets it off of Laird Road where we currently have both the charter and Franklin sharing the same school site. Some benefits to the town, um, it would provide an additional gymnasium and fields for youth, uh, Loomis youth sports programs. Uh, as most of you know, we're currently the parks and recreation department for the town of Loomis. Uh, we provide the gymnasiums, the soccer fields, the baseball fields, lacrosse fields, uh, and even some of the flag football fields for the uh, flag football program. So we're, we're the town parks and rec, and this provides more facility for the, the youth of our community. It provides more housing options within the town of Loomis, yet outside of downtown. And I know there was, uh, in one of the previous presentations, the talk of a loss of X number of lots due to a, a zoning request. This would help add back that, but it also um, provides those houses outside of that downtown, which we know is going to be a real challenge in the future. I'll talk a little bit more about more houses built, mean more fees collected by the town and more fees collected by the school district. Um, the location of the school keeps the traffic away from downtown and Taylor Road. And um, basically it creates space at Franklin School to house the impact of developments that are going in down in that area that aren't necessarily Loomis developments, but Rockland developments, College Park is one of them. That will produce about 200 students. If we don't have space at Franklin School by relocating the charter, 
Those students will be assigned to Loomis Grammar School, which means they'll be coming up Sierra College and down Taylor Road to get to Loomis Grammar. And as some of you may know, the traffic on Taylor Road next year will be significantly more challenging because the change in state laws for high school start times will be placing Del Oro starting at 830, the same time as all the elementary schools in the community. So that will create an additional downtown problem of traffic that we're going to try to help avoid by keeping that <laughs> charter program and keeping those new residents down in that south portion of the, the town. Uh, it provides a distribution of growth across the town of Loomis and not just in the downtown region. Uh, we are uh, meeting with the Hidden Grove developers in the next few weeks talking about their development and the impacts that it'll have on our schools as well. Uh, and there's very few property owners that will be in <coughs> the position of the school and Premier Homes development. In fact, the, the allocation of lots and size of lots is exactly consistent to St. Francis, the contiguous property to the west. Um, and St. Francis, as you know, is a, a very um, uh, successful and well-proven property uh, and, and development in the Loomis area. And um, so it allows Premier to build a very similar project to St. Francis, which is, is proven to be a positive contribution to the Loomis community. The rezoning makes it more financial palatable for uh, Premier Homes to provide us the 12 to 15 acres uh, at such the reduced cost that, that, that we've discussed. And partnering with LUSD creates a cost structure utility cost for both parties. Gordon, One, I yes. think you, you beeped out a little bit. Can you just repeat your last two sentences? Certainly. Um, the rezoning makes it more financially palatable for Premier Homes to provide the district the property we need at such a reduced cost. And secondly, partnering with LUSD creates with Premier Homes a cost savings option for both of us in terms of infrastructure and utility costs. Finally, some benefits to all. Most importantly, if we can have this rezoned as part of the general plan, it significantly reduces options for the city of Rockland to challenge, delay, or interfere with our development. It provides an example to future developers of partnering with town businesses and agencies to protect the integrity of the community and provide additional resources. Um, finally, Premier Homes is a local builder. They are. Uh, Kevin himself lives in Loomis and has a long-standing experience with Placer County and, and with the, the district of Loomis that he's going to talk about uh, now. So thank you. Yeah, I'll just add a few things here and let you, we won't keep you long. But um, just, just this is just a unique opportunity. Um, it's not often, you know, it, the fact even that Gordon is here with us and we're a developer builder and we're working together on this. A lot of times there's a little bit of uh, uh, opposing uh, elements instead of trying to work together. And I think this property and what was started here long before we uh, landed on it, we want to um, respect and try to see if we can help perfect going forward. So, um, and yes, I'm you know, 22 years in Loomis. Um, my children went to Franklin Elementary. I had... Uh, I even had a little stint on the board. I was appointed to it during a brief period where three multi-purpose buildings were being built um, on different campuses to help with that from the building side. Um, so we love our town, we love Loomis, and um, you know, we hope to actually be here on this property ourselves um, as my wife and I as part of the plan. And um, you know, we, we build beautiful homes. I, my father, I came up through a home, um, it is uh, educating me. He was a custom builder. I've done that for years. And um, so we appreciate you listening to what we're, we're dreaming about and um, would ask you to consider our request to try to help us bring, bring it together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, um, for your presentation. I'd like to open this up for committee comments and questions.
Tim, you have your hand up. Thank you, Jan. Um, well, let me just mention uh, that, you know, the charter school has quite a history. It was never meant to be in its current location in perpetuity. And the challenge for the charter school has always been to find its own uh, campus. My kids go there, so I, I'm there twice a day sometimes. I'm familiar with the campus. And if anybody were to go to the charter school right now, they would see that it's probably the smallest elementary school they've ever seen. I mean, it's hilarious how uh, small the play area is, and especially in comparison to some of the other schools in the district. So, you know, I think a lot of charter school families are feeling, you know, as though they are stepchildren, nothing against step families, but um, it was never the, the, the current situation and arrangement with the charter school was never meant to be forever. And it was always up to the charter school and hopefully the town and the school district to, to find a, um, a, an alternative location once the charter school had um, gotten its, its feet underneath it. And so, um, you know, it's, it really is a unique opportunity for not only the school district, but also the town and the families that, that go to uh, the schools. And what I'm hearing from the applicant is that this is going to relieve some of the pressure from the other schools um, and maybe some traffic too, which, you know, I think that we can all um, uh, agree that that's important. Um, I, I really like the way that St. Francis uh, uh, Woods neighborhood turned out. Those are really uh, nice lots. They're still considered rural residential by their own zoning definition. So keeping them at one acres, um, I think is uh, important. And, you know, we're not talking about medium or even high density um, housing. So you know, I, I'm supportive of this. I, I, I do have a question of staff. Um, there's a lot of other reasons I think it's important, uh, uh, but I, I want to get to a question. Um, so the map that the applicant um, proposed showed like 30 uh, lots. And my question is, how do we ensure that, you know, if we, if, if this committee recommends their request and then the council ultimately approves it, how do we ensure that, that the school district gets the, the location that it's proposing, because what I see is a bunch of housing uh, lots uh, or residential lots. Uh, but then one of the other slides shows a school uh, cut into it. So how, how, do, how do we, how does our recommendation stay consistent with the intent of, of I think what the school district is proposing? I can, I can respond to that if you'd like. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I, yeah, we both can. Um, yeah, I really, it's it, the reason, and, and um, understand what you're saying, Tim. The reason it's drawn up the way it is, is we don't have a legal parcel to get to the uh, school district at this point. And we'll be a little bit of time before we do. And, you know, the school district also is putting their uh, items together to uh, be able to go forward on this parcel once we we get it um, a, a tentative map that allows for it. And we need to be protected in a sense that should the district not go forward, if we, we've got a side uh, agreement that is um, being drafted that says that they have the option, the right to those lots that were identified in that dotted line. It's theirs to take, um, they can move forward with it, but um, it's, it's still going to be zoned overall as are in on the chance something happens that we can't be at risk for that if the school for some reason school district was was not able to go forward that was the primary purpose yeah and, and the other side of that um, we're actually working on a legal agreement uh, we were using our our legal counsel to work on an agreement that we could have in place if tonight we can get the approval uh, through this committee the umbrella committee. We know there's two more steps along the way. There's planning commission and there's council. We will most definitely have our, our legal agreement in place by the time it gets to planning uh, 
uh, sorry, planning commission, uh, so that this recommendation, should that not occur, then, then that would be something for the planning commission to consider. What I can tell you is from a school district standpoint, Tim, I have the absolute faith in Premier Homes working alongside of us and providing for us at what we've discussed in the past. In fact, Kevin reached out to us after purchasing the property because it was made clear by the previous owners there was an interest. He reached out to us and started the conversation. Um, this wasn't me banging on his door and, and uh, trying to take his land. Uh, it was very much a, a, a reach out by him, but we can have legal document, an agreement prior to the planning commission approval of these recommendations that you're getting tonight. Thank, thank you, Gordon and Kevin. I, I, I just have one final comment, Jan, before I turn it back over. Um, I Listen, we are not going to get a lot of more of opportunities out there to find another school site um, in the town limits. And I, you know, I, I, I'd hate to lose a, a, a golden opportunity. It sounds like a, a great um, partnership as far as sharing the, in, the infrastructure costs and the grading costs. Um, again, there's not going to be a lot of these opportunities that come up for the town. And um, w when they come up, I, I think it's really important to seriously consider them and seize the moment. So um, I'm going to support this. Um, and I hope that uh, we can move it forward and move it to planning commission. And um, I think uh, it would be a good thing for the town, the school district, our kids, the families, and hopefully the town. Thank you, Jan. Sure. Thank you, Tim. I, we have some other hands up. I'm not sure who was first. Ramona. Ramona. Yeah, I have a question um, for Gordon or uh, more or less a property owner. Um, what's the uh, reasoning for requesting rural residential rather res than res estate? Um, this is Kevin. Uh, it really is, is just because of the size of the piece of property we're going to get to the school um, and then the opposite opposing corner, we're trying to keep a, a lot count that would be close after we give those lots up um, to what we would have had if it was just, we were just going in. Um, if we had the residential estate, we wouldn't necessarily get there. And it's, uh, um, it's just, we're also trying to make it to where we don't want to do anything that's going to drop it below, say, uh, St. Francis Woods. It's a beautiful community. Um, we want to be a good neighbor. We want to, you know, preserve the pond that they also get to appreciate. And so with us working around all those features on the property, plus giving the land up, we need to at least get to a place where it pencils to also help with the costs um, for the school and sharing those costs with them. And, and that's what, that's why the request of the rural residential. Okay, um, Beth has her hand up. Um, I have two questions, I think, about this. One, what is the size of these two parcels? You know, if it's like 50 acres and it used to have the ability to develop, say, 10 houses, and now the request is to potentially develop 50 houses. Uh, so I'd like to know the size of the parcels. Um, combined size. And then two is the option for the uh, Loomis Basin, the, the charter school, is it available if it remains residential acreage or is this only available to the school district and the charter school if the land use gets changed? So I, I think the first, the, I, I can answer the second question, Beth, if I may. Uh, in terms of zoning for a school, the zoning isn't necessarily important as a, as a state agency. We have um, options available to us with regards to um, where we build schools and the zoning that's required. Uh, so that's not as critical to us as, as um, it, it would be to a commercial or a private industry. So we, ha we have some options uh, through um, the state that allows us to build schools. The state comes out and approves. And by the way, 
we have had the state come out and walk the property to give uh, uh, a preliminary approval that that is suitable for a school site. So really that's the agency that we go through in terms of the, the approval of the, the property. I think Kevin can answer the um, lot difference. I know it's not 50. Right, um, right. It's a, it's really uh, less than 20. The, the um, school takes um, 12 or 13 actually of the, yeah, 13. Uh, of the lots away. Um, and, and it was, uh, as, as Tim was saying, 30 lots, it, we're down in 18 lots. And what we lose, we lose 40% of our lots if we just went with the standard zoning and, and then let the school get the acreage they, they need. We lose 40% of the lots and it leaves us with nothing really left to have um, of an ability to build a home uh, sell a home, generate something that can help us to cost share with the school district and and really pencil for this, this joint effort that we're working on. If I could add on to that, that um, zoning code allows schools, you know, public facilities um, in any residential district. But what I'm hearing from the developer is they will not sell the 14 acres or whatever to the school district unless it is rezoned to residential, uh, rural residential. It would make it very hard to do so. Uh, I, I will say that. I, we never say never and we like the idea of putting something together, but it would be very hard to do so. And Kevin, how many units with the school on that site could you get in the RR zoning? With the, if the school's there, it's uh, 18. 18. 18, I believe. Okay. Which is really um, two, 2.3. Um, it's 40, 40 acres, so the equivalent is if it was a 2.3 acre uh, count of lots there at that point. Thank you. Dean has her hand up. Go ahead, Jean. You're muted. I had, I had to unmute. Uh, <laughs> one is a question about, about the school, and of course that's way down the road, but I just wondered if our town engineered, since I live out in that area and I'm aware that schools do cause a lot of traffic and that's already a congested uh, intersection, has our town engineer looked at, at that proposal as far as the driveways and things at this point? Not at this point, Gene. We, we have no application. This is strictly land use general plan update. Okay. So my one of my concerns is if if the school did not go in, there's no way that I would be in favor of putting RR one acre lots on this site. Um, I, I think you know, we are probably considering it mainly so that we could do the school. But if the school didn't go in, it would bother me a lot if we have zoned this to RR and then we're stuck with something that we probably would not do otherwise. Um, if you look at how things look out there, one of the things Loomis is trying to do is preserve its rural look and across the street is the church and it yes it's zone three uh, 2.3 but it's actually the church is on two lots and it has to probably stay on two lots because part of its drainage pond is on the second lot so that's going to stay a rural look um below it the the tail end of saint francis woods that comes out onto barton road i believe those are are um, RA lots, so that's going to keep a rural look. And when people drive by St. Francis Woods, they don't really see one acre lots. What you see is a large setback to a wall and it's fairly, except for the entrance, it's fairly naturalistic kind of landscaping. So people aren't aware that of the size of the lots in there unless they've been in to visit somebody. 
and you have to be able to, you know, get into a gated community to do that. So I'm concerned about preserving the rural look out here and not just um, making it look more and more uh, congested and unrural as you get to this intersection. Um, now, I would hope then that the lots that are at least along Barton and, and uh, Rockland Road can be made to look more rural. Um, when we did Montclair, which is on the other side of St. Francis Woods, those are one acre lots. And at the time, one acre lots were kind of being put in as more um, semi-rural sort of things, sort of homes. And that was what was envisioned. But what we saw is uh, very large homes being put on the one acre lots. And a lot of these lots, it looked to me like are kind of wedges and a chunk of it is also down to the lake. So they're not gonna have that much building site. Well, actually that doesn't look all that semi-rural when you look at, at Montclair. Yes, they are now worth a lot of money. A lot of those are now going over for over a million dollars. These I'm sure will be pretty nice high-end sort of things. I'm just concerned if we zone this and then the school doesn't go in, we will have rezoned an RA corner that we would have preferred, I think, to keep at 4.6 RA. And then we have instead a large subdivision, large for Loomis, not for Rockland, but, but um, that's a concern to me that, that if we rezone this and the school doesn't go in, we are then obligated to, to honor our putting in an RR subdivision that I think we wouldn't otherwise put in. So any comment on that? And could keeping I, it semi I, Jan, may I respond to Jean? Okay, Jean, first of all, thank you very much. Um, I, I love your comments because your comments are focused on the school and ensuring that we're able to, to do that. And I, I can assure you, um, we, we have been looking for over five years for a location. In fact, back, um, gosh, I think five or six years ago, we approached the um, former property owners, the, um, the, the, the nuns, as people would refer to the property owners, uh, about acquiring that corner lot. We've been working on that one. We actually have twice um, put in to purchase that property, uh, but we've been outbid, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, it's been a spot we've looked at for a long time. We One of the things you'll notice is uh, on the picture that we're sharing here, the school We've asked that the buildings be pushed down into the center and, and inside with keeping, there'll be some uh, uh, mounds that will be on the outside to kind of keep that separate. So you just don't see all those buildings as you drive up. Uh, maintaining some of the rural landscape, we're gonna try to keep as many trees as possible on that, that piece of property. And I appreciate your, your concern for the school. I can assure you, uh, first and foremost, the charter school has uh, funding to purchase the lot outright. Um, as soon as we're able to get to the point where we can move forward with this, uh, it is absolutely our intention. Um, one thing to bring that I will share, Gene, I appreciate you bringing up the, the Rockland Road in Barton. There's, a, there's three lots that, that, would be remaining for premier homes on Rockland Road and only two lots on Barton Road. So out of all of the home lots, there's only five lots that actually would be a, uh, and depending upon how traffic comes in, uh, they may not come in on um, Rockland Road. It's not sure how that'll look yet. So Rockland Road may very well. Yeah, we would, we would, be, we would seek to continue the same look as St. Francis Woods and, and build a nice buffer all the way over to the school property. And then uh, we would, we purposely conceptually put this together with only one entrance into the residential lots, which is down 
on Barton Road near Wells. Um, and it, with a with the property as it currently is zoned, if there wasn't a school here, the only way it really works is a bunch of multiple driveways coming in off Barton and Rockland Road to try to access those bigger lots. That goes away. Um, so it really actually, I think we could do a nice, a nicer job of a buffer. And, and to your point about the lots, they, they're mostly interior, just like St. Francis Wood. So um, we have the larger ones up against, like Gordon was saying, only five of them in total. Yeah. Yeah, the other piece is if you notice in our schematic drawing that's uh, that we're showing of the school, one of the absolute um, design uh, requirements that we we want to put in is you notice there's parking and drop off on both north and south of the school to try to reduce that traffic flow. Uh, it you know that that'll be a long drop off area so that. Our intent is to try to mitigate some of the traffic in that area by having two drop-off locations and very large parking areas. Uh, that was part of the need for us to have that amount of acreage uh, so that we could do that and maintain some of the traffic, uh, well, at least mitigate some of the traffic by having the school there. And your trips would actually be minimized going to Franklin now. Right. Um, and, and there are already a lot of them are coming through this way anyway to get to Franklin, right? Currently to the current charter school, right? So those that are coming from the east would probably hit the Barton Road, uh, and then those coming from the north would probably hit Rockland Road as their entry points. And so trying to look at a design on the corner that would help mitigate traffic issues. And thanks, thanks again, Gene. I appreciate you having the school as a concern. I can share with you, I fully trust that uh, Kevin, um, th that the, the property will be provided to us in agreement um, as soon as we're able to move forward. Are we going to be asked for a, a bond on this, by the way? On, on what? On building the school? Well, the charter school's uh, an independent, uh, sorry, a dependent charter. It, it funds itself. So this is somewhat tangential, but I'm, I'm confused about to what extent it is or isn't part of our school district. It is a dependent charter. Our school district started it. Uh, it's just that its funding comes in separately. Okay. But we run, we operate it, we do all of the functions of, we hire all the staff, we pay all the staff, we provide all the benefits. We do all of those things. Um, could could we see the the um, subdivision map again? Sure. And again, this is very conceptual. But what would happen is um, the the road that is the circle loop road that goes through what would be the school property. It just it comes to a cul-de-sac at the end up by what's called out as lot 12 and 24. So it, it, would, it would just dead, dead in there. Actually, I was wrong. There's only four lots, two that would back Rockland Road and then the two that would be on Barton Road total. And they're pretty, the bigger ones. We've actually, right. up, especially up to the north, we get a lot of room to have some um, continuation of what is created in front of St. Francis Woods. So those, those, look, they, those do look like fairly generous lots, so they wouldn't have to look that unrural. You might be needing to put a second emergency outlet someplace too, and just, you know, eventually. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Um, Greg, I don't know if it was Greg or Ramona that had their hand up first, but Greg, go ahead. You're muted, Greg. Okay, there we go. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a kind of a really uh, huge project uh, with a lot of uh, considerations that could just kind of got dropped on us. Um, uh, everybody's raising a lot of good points and a lot of good, a lot of concerns. Uh, the idea of the school merging with a residential project, uh, I think it's a good, a good idea, a good project. But our discussion 
in this amount of detail is probably beyond the scope of this committee because there's so many things to consider. Uh, really, we're here just about doing some uh, zoning changes. Uh, and it's great that you come forth to describe your project so that we know what we're looking at and moving ahead. But I think we need to think it out from the uh, point of view that if one entity or another pulls out, either the school pulls out leaving the residential project or vice versa, which is granted unlikely, we have to think about what is the aftermath of that and what are we going to do with that and is that what we want? So I think there needs to be a lot of uh, you know, discussion at maybe town staff, town manager level uh, and council to think about what we wanna do and then kind of come back. If this committee tonight, if anything, I would maybe recommend that you make a tentative recommendation, uh, recommendation to make this land change uh, zoning change with the idea that by the time it did go to the planning commission, we'd have a lot more information uh, about where we want to proceed with this project. Um, so anyway, um, there, I think that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Uh, Ramona? Um, yeah, that was a nice point, um, Greg, because, uh, yeah, we're getting into the weeds quite a bit with this, and understandably so, because there's obviously a concept that's been presented to us. A couple <laughs> questions. One is how far out uh, do you see if this project goes as um, anticipated with the school site being there? How far out do you see construction taking place? It would, it would kind of fall in, in line with the general plan schedule. Um, I think we would, you know, be kind of tied to it, right? So depending on when that finalized would be kind of be the trigger for us. Um, but we don't, we don't anticipate it being anything until um, 2023 <laughs> are able to start looking at um, development plans and improvement plans. So um, probably how, not critical until maybe even 2024. Okay, and how about for the school? Yeah, Ramon, great question. We actually have already started ed specs. Uh, ed spec specifications are required by the state. Doesn't necessarily have to identify the school on a specific piece of property, but it outlines the specifications for the school architect to develop the plans. Uh, as soon as the location is, is identified, then you can take those ed specs and, and lay them down onto the plan and then start to perfect it towards the exact design that you want for the school. So we've actually already started ed specs for that school and uh, they should be finished sometime before the end of 2022. And so our timing would be very similar in that, um, you know, in the 23, 24 timeframe, Again, because we're going through the general plan process, the general plan would have to come to completion for the, us then to move forward with the, the um, design, specific design with, within that, um, uh, the criteria that we're asking for. So, but we are already started. We've, we've been going for a little bit now because you know, if not here, we just don't know where we're gonna have to get the land. Okay. Um, other thought I have on this is, because um, that's taking quite a jump, asking from rural res ag to rural residential. And I think I heard that, you know, if you kind of take it into consideration with the carve out for the property for the school, that what is left isn't kind of an average of 2.3 uh, acres per lot, which sounds like, I believe, somewhat like res estate. So, um, my... uh, that actually it is if the whole site, it would be equivalent in a lot count if the whole site was built out at 2.3. So it's not what leaves the, okay. the, the lots left aren't, aren't able to get to that. Exactly. Side. Yeah. But in general, but what that kind of, kind of points me in the direction of is would, especially since this is towards the periphery of our town, um, uh, have you ever considered, uh, doing a cluster development. It looks like it's getting close to that anyway in the way you have it laid out is that in the very center part, the lots are a little narrower and smaller. So I, I don't know if this would be a good candidate to do kind of a more cluster 
development idea to really emphasize the more rural character uh, that we would like to keep uh, retained and perceived on the uh, edges, you know, and it, it already kind of is that obviously because uh, there's only two lots that face Rockland Road and two lots that face Barton Road. So I just thought it might be a different strategy instead of going rural res that it might be rural estate with a cluster development design to achieve uh, just a thought if that could work out. If, if it, we, we entertained that, we just didn't know, you know, we kind of were wanting to be sensitive to the adjacent properties and knowing that this is just a, St. Francis Woods is really well done. And this will be exactly what that is. Um, we thought about on the internal uh, portion of this, maybe a little bit of a cluster area of a half acre, maybe a more attainable opportunity for people, um, a little bit of a mix, but then that's even another step of, um, away from what's the, what's currently zoned and we just we didn't think we would go there we, we feel like we kind of can achieve the same feel from all the periphery for all the people that are impacted and still these lots i know they look like they get into slivers because they they get their acre by going into the pond but you know they're far away from saint francis um where they get actually built because of where the water high water mark is on the pond and um then going with the larger lots along the only other areas that are kind of adjacent, even to the property um, to the south, we kind of you can see those are certainly not thin lots, or you know they're they're good size, and so we did spread them out a little bit accordingly, and, and went tighter just to the center. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. I mean, I, I it it you know it, it's one of these cases where I agree with Gene that you know there'd be no way in the world I don't think had the school not been a part of this that we would consider going from res ag to rural res in that area. Um, so just trying to see if there's some way to, um, you know, without the guarantee of the school going in to uh, uh, treat this parcel both ways that the school may not go there, which I mean, it sounds like it is very well on its way to being there, but you never know. Um, and, you know, without that, actual school project being there, I, I don't think it would be a very palatable um, change for uh, what the town would consider to be uh, in character with the rest of the area. Because again, St. Francis Woods, yeah, you, you don't really know it's there. It's so hidden in a sense from view. Maybe this would be the same. It would really be the same. Thank you, Ramona. Um, Beth? So my comment was gonna be similar to the last two um, committee members that I'm curious if we can just, if we do make a recommendation to um, recommend to re reallocate these lots as residential, rural residential, um, is it possible to make it contingent on an agreement, an actual, you know, signed agreement in place with the school district. Um, and then if not, then it remains, uh, our recommendation would be to remain as rural agricultural. I mean, I guess that's a question. And also that is my recommendation, if it's possible. That would be you a good You could make your recommendation for... subject yeah. to that that agreement being in place by the time this gets to the city council or the, the town council. Yeah, I think you need to, to remember where we're at with the process, right? The committee still needs to finish its work for that up to the planning commission. Planning commission needs to finish its work and then including the EIR and all that stuff and then go to council. So by the time that we get to council, if the agreement's not in place, then the recommendation from the committee would be generally to leave it as is, I would suppose. And the developer would need to just process the regular general plan amendment. But it I seems that there's plenty enough time there for the district and the developer to get that agreement figured out, uh, at least the agreement. Yeah. And so, so, Sean, but Sean, I think it would be contingent upon um, the signed agreement before the planning commission, not, not the council, is that correct? 
It could either it, either way you want to do it, whatever the committee's you know decision is. I don't I don't think that even even looking at the timing to get to the planning commission and get through with you know moving forward with EIR and all that stuff, we're still a little bit away on that. So there should be enough time to get that figured out. I would assume. And and be aware, it's going to go to the planning commission twice before it goes to the council. Yeah. So the committee recommendation goes to the planning commission, and they say yes, this is a general plan we want to be considered in the environmental impact report. That at that point in time, then the document is made the draft general plan, and the EIR is prepared. Uh, goes out for circulation. Then the planning commission will make another decision on making a recommendation to the council. So there's two planning commission cycles, and then the the uh, council cycle after that. Um, so as Sean said, there's plenty of time. And I think best recommendation as a motion might be appropriate, which is it remains our A, uh, unless uh, a deal is cut, and then the committee would recommend the, the school site with the um, RR. OK, thank you. Uh, Tim, Tim has his hand up. Thank you again. Uh, after hearing all the comments, I, uh, I I wanted to add a couple uh, things. First of all, uh, the parks again. You know, you can't go too many days without hearing people talk about how much we need parks in this town, and um, this seems like a an opportunity to expand that uh, that opportunity. So. Um, Want to keep that in mind and you know just listening to, you know greg you you, you said it uh, really well i'm not going to try to repeat what you said but you know there are going to be uh, at least two more backstops here um uh and our our uh role here tonight is to make a recommendation and um you know part of a recommendation is making a decision to make a recommendation but um Let's, you know, what we want to do is, I think, hopefully set the planning commission and the, the council up for at least deliberating on this, something like this, right? Without getting into the weeds and saying, you know, without reviewing the environmental documents um, and all the other particulars of the project. So if we can hand them an opportunity, uh, at least we can have a broader discussion with the community and um, we can... Um, bring more people into the discussion. And so there's, my, my point is there's, there's still a few more steps here, as everybody's saying. My recommendation is um, to recommend the request of the applicant subject to uh, a, a, an agreement with the school um, and then move that forward. And planning commission will have an opportunity to, to um, either accept our recommendation or not but I think it's important to continue to move this forward. So we give, we give a message and send a message to the school district that, yep, we're open to the discussion. And I think that that's um, important in, in their negotiations and, and their planning that uh, the, the, this, at this level, we were supportive at least to have the initial conversation. So that would, I don't know how to, Put all of that into words, but that would be my recommendation. Um, open to hearing others as well. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Tim. I see Bonnie's hand up. Thanks, Jan. Um, so if I recall, when we were um, going through this site and the reason that we came to no recommendation, it was because it leapfrogged the different land designations from the RA all the way to RR and skipped the RE. Um, and then the other you know, I guess um, approach that we were encouraged to take is to look at this as, you know, a 20 to 30 to even 50 year plan, as opposed to just by project, um, you know, specific. And so one thought is, um, you know, again, because I do think that there is an, um, an interest in the school and wanting to explore that further, but it isn't guaranteed at this point, and hopefully it will at some point. Um, would the developer or would the owner be interested in a land use designation to RE at this point? And then once the school documents and um, project becomes more assured, you know, then that's when we would consider the RR, just a different perspective to consider. 
Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Jean. Jean, you're muted. Jean, we still can't hear you. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. I like the way that Anders put it better, which was to leave it RA um, unless or until, however he put it, uh, we get the uh, an agreement with the school district on uh, on, on the school site, at which time to to uh, consider then the R R R. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on um, the committee? How about you, Randy? Haven't heard from you. Is Randy still on? Uh, yes. No comment. Okay. Is there any members of the public? Yes, Miguel, you can unmute. Thank you. I have mixed feelings about this. There was a big battle with Montserrat. Originally, they came in requesting one acre parcels that was turned down. They came back with two and a half acre parcels that was turned down. And finally, they agreed to the 4.6, which was demonstrated um, to maintain the rural character of Loomis. When you look at this site on that corner, you see a massive um, amount of trees, a strawberry farm, a very agricultural look. By rezoning this down to this property, all of that will be gone. Um, also concerns that while you talk about St. Francis Woods, that was kind of something that was run in there. And if you go into St. Francis Woods and you can compare that to Montserrat, you'll see the big difference. As was pointed out, they're big lots, I'm sorry, big houses on small lots. It's not very rural. It's more like what you see out at Granite Bay. Uh, also, I think, you know, th this would be a drastic change. I can see where they need a school site. Uh, and maybe this is a good location for it. But I'm concerned that why can't you just designate the school site as school zones for school? And that way, that's all it could be used for. My other concern is the lake. That's a great, could be potentially a great public asset. Uh, to have it backed up by, all by houses, it means the public will never be able to enjoy that lake. I'd like to see something designed where there's a, trail around that lake that the public could walk along and enjoy it. So real mixed feelings. I would go along with the um, idea that unless the school site is approved that the zoning on this property be 4.6 acres. And also I wanna strongly recommend that public access be allowed along that lake. Thank you. I can speak for to it for a moment. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Um, answer Miguel's question. I think your comments. Um, I also speak to comment for a moment. There is a Miguel. There is the common space there. You see, and the intent of that was to bring people down into what will be an easement along. you you bleeped out, Kevin. Okay. The the common space would be the access point to an easement along the back of the lots that um, abut the pond so that people could enjoy it, not just those few lots. So that it would be more available for people to enjoy. Um, and I think the other thing that um, I appreciated Tim's understanding of the timing on this, um, we need to, continue forward with a plan to be able to put together an agreement with the school. And if we don't know that this would be a viable thing um, that we could look at as getting the rezone, it's very hard to plan this property that, that way going forward. And, and if I went to the, I think the last one I wanted to respond to comment about going to residential estate, um, 
The problem with that is that's only one lot more left than if I just left it what it's zoned right now and didn't have a school. So I think, that, and I probably didn't explain that well earlier, but it, it takes this down to a lot count that's only one lot more than, and, then, and at that point, I'm better off just leaving the zoning, building it out just as residential, no school, and, and having accesses that are less expensive to put in off of Barton and off of Rockland Road. So um, that's, that's the reason we kind of landed where we did. I think in fact, it explains a little bit better, maybe. And, and Jan, if I may, um, from a district's perspective as well, similar to, to, to Kevin, um, you know, what, what we would really like is even if it's a tentative approval uh, with an agreement by the time it gets to planning commission, it will be hard for us to continue to move forward with this, not knowing whether it's going to get approval or not, at least coming out of this group, if it's a tentative approval based upon the fact that the school district benefits dramatically um, and that an agreement needs to be in place that holds the, the developer builder responsible for uh, what's promised to the school district, we're happy to have that. We could definitely have that ready by the time it gets to planning commission. Did we lose Jan? I think she froze. I'm gonna give her a couple of minutes. Um, I know that she was having, she was expecting some difficulty at her, uh, her home, hold on. In the meantime, Miguel has his hand up. Miguel? Go ahead and unmute Miguel. Okay, I had a question of the school district. All the development that's going to be on the corner of Rockland Road and Sierra College, is that within your school district? Rockland and Barton. I think, I, Kevin, I think, or actually, Gordon, I think Miguel's question is directed at you. If the, the development that's, that's proposed in Rockland on Sierra College is in the district or not? Yeah, yes, that's part of the whole reason we want to move forward with this is College Park is within the Loomis School District, even though it's in the city of Rockland. Uh, that will produce somewhere in the neighborhood of 250 students. If we don't create space at Franklin by relocating the charter, those 250 students are going to be going straight up Sierra College to Taylor Road to Loomis Grammar. Sorry, so, not so. oh. Jan, I don't know how, how much of mine was I lost, but we're really, it's timing for us to move forward. And that's why we requested, I don't know if you heard the end of our my comments about requesting a tentative approval uh, with it. Yeah, approval. I guess. I think it might have been me that you guys weren't hearing, right? I've I was talking for a while and nobody heard me. I'm sure I'm assuming. Is that right? Yeah, right. you froze. <laughs> okay. So because I really haven't had a chance to to tell you, you know, my thoughts on this. And um I I have heard a lot of really, really wonderful things. I think that it sounds like um, you know, the school you know is something that might be a positive thing. I just worry that this is a really big project um, that is mostly in conceptual conception at this moment. Um, and so I, you know, kind of, uh, kind of echoing what Greg was saying that um, there's a lot of parts and pieces to this. Um, and there's things about the lot sizes that may change as you are working through this project. Um, so, uh, I feel like I feel like you have a great idea and I think that idea on a general mode is oh, oh Jan you froze oh she's back you're back you're not maybe cut your video 
I cut the video. Shoot. Okay, we can hear you now. Okay. All right. Um, anyway, I, um, I, my internet's unstable. Let's, um, I'm going to stop talking for now because I think other people have their hands up. Ramona? Yeah, um, so bringing up the proposed development that's on the Rockland side, uh, what are the obligations of that developer in development for meeting the needs uh, for the for students? I mean, I know they're in our Loomis Union School District, um, but what? how does that work with their development and their obligations to help alleviate their impact on our schools, whether it's a school that is inside the Loomis boundaries, which I mean, most many schools are outside in the county land of Loomis Union District, but this, you know, if there would be a proposal to have a school built on land on that development side on Rockland, it would be a school residing in the town limits of Rockland. But I'm just curious, how does that work with them, considering that the development is going to be impacting Loomis Union District from Rockland and their obligations? For development in Rockland. Uh, yeah, that that would be great, Ramona. If um, if that could come true. The unfortunately, we tried to work with the developer and the home builder. Uh, the developer, the coal, um, the father and son developer. Oh man, everybody's breaking up. We lost you, Gordon. Yeah, Gordon. Am I there? Yeah, we missed the last bit though. All right, maybe close. Um, so uh, we've been working with that developer for years. And when I say years, I mean years. And um, at one point we were trying to get land within their development, but at a price of 30 million over 20 years that they would lease the land to us. Uh, that, that just doesn't pencil out for a school district. Um, and it was a much smaller piece. It was about a 10 acre parcel. And, and I appreciate Ramona, your, your concern for the, but you know, the developer is hiding and the builder, they're hiding behind SP 330. And they don't have to, and I see Sean nodding, and they, they don't have to do squat anymore. They don't have to mitigate. They can pay the minimum statutory requirements and do the minimum planning commission, minimum council meetings, and get their projects approved. And so we're finding it very difficult to work with most of the developers that are hiding behind SB 330. And just so you know, that project now has 400 and 25 homes, and they've now added 270 apartments uh, on the, the south portion that runs. Gordon, we lost you. Hello. Jan, are you on? Jan has to call in, so I'm giving her the uh, information. I'm back on now. Was, oh, okay. Okay, never mind. Okay. Gosh, I'm sorry, everybody. We're having such technical difficulties. Um, and I know it's getting late. Um, anybody else have their hand up? We're back. Sorry about that. We lost you for a minute. Yeah, um, everybody's uh, internet was sort of in and out. Um, everybody's hand, anybody else's hand is up? Nope. Nope. All right, uh, committee, what is your feeling on this? 
Is there Kim? If if we're getting to that, are we ready to make a a motion, Jan? Or are we still uh, taking comment? Um. Let's see. Yeah, no, if you, uh, I'm just kind of trying to get a sense of, of where the committee's at. Um, I feel, I think I, I, you know, I said, I think this is a really big deal for Loomis and I don't think it's a bad idea at all. I just feel like there's a lot of parts and pieces and I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with the, the, the in-depth um, into the weeds kind of conversation that we're in. Um, but I wanted to get the sense from the rest of the committee about you know the direction we want to go. I know where you want to go, Tim. You've been really clear, which is great. Um, and so I just kind of want to get a, a, an idea from the rest of us, uh, rest of the people on, on the committee where, where, where they think is the best, what's the best we can do in this instance. So, um, I see no hands raised. Okay. So if there is anybody willing to make a motion, I guess we could make a motion at this time. That would be good. Jan, I'd make a motion to um, recommend the uh, developers, I'm sorry, the, uh, the applicants request subject to um, a condition that the project is approved or subject to the project, including a school. And remember no. that this is still a very early stage that we're at and there's gonna be time for a lot more discussion and review and, and so on. But um, I think it's important to send the right message uh, if that is the right message to uh, the applicant, so. All right, thank you, Tim. Jean has her hand up. I think that's a little stronger than I would want to put it. Uh, I think we're talking about the same direction, but um, when he talks about a different, it, I'm not sure he, even what levels of approvals he, he was meaning there because that's a lot of these approvals are way, way down the road. Um, I still like better saying that either direction, either say leave it RA unless we get the agreement with, you know, between the school district and the developer for that school property, or um, may say that we approve it subject to getting that approval um, from the school district. So that if we don't get that agreement, we don't, we haven't committed ourselves to changing it to, to our, our, which I think the majority of this group would not change if it weren't for the school project. Okay, so Jean, what would your, what would the difference between your motion and Tim's motion be? Tim sounded to me a lot giving more than I, unless I didn't understand him, it sounded like giving more approvals than there's no proof. There's no approval that I'm recommending. I'm, I, 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 I'm recommending that the, that we move it forward in a proactive way, right? I think I think what you're suggesting is more defensive posturing, and I think you know what I'm suggesting is that the committee um, recommends that uh, we uh, accept the developers, the applicants' request, subject to the school being part of it. And, you know, in the end, I think we're saying the same thing, but I'm, I'm suggesting that we, we actually recommend their request rather than not do anything and wait, because what you're saying, what you're saying by not doing anything, unless they get a, uh, an agreement with the, the school district is really nothing. I mean, we're not, we're not, making a recommendation other than to not do anything. And I, I just think it's important to be proactive and send a message to the applicant that, you know, that, that it's important that we take this under further consideration. Okay, okay. so how do, we, how do we say that and still effectively be defensive? Because I think it's important that we don't simply approve this without the school, the school project being there. We, we say it, it should be contingent upon the school being part of the project, I think. 
is, is probably the way it, you would phrase it. And it looks like there's a set, there is a recommendation, the second portion of the recommendation that says remains RA until an agreement is reached with the school district at which time it is changed, it, it is changed to RR. Would that be sufficient? Okay, what's highlighted in yellow up there? There's two yes. recommendations. There's two ways to, to phrase it in the highlighted recommendation. One is I think what I'm suggesting and the second is what Gene is suggesting. And Correct. I think it, you know, they're, they're probably, the end product is probably the same, uh, although one is more proactive and one's more defensive. And um, I mean, it, it kind of comes down to what kind of message we want to send to the applicant. I think does it matter? Heard. Does staff? I mean, does staff have some input on this? I, it depends on the way that you want to go. I, I think what Tim is trying to say is basically, I mean, because Tim has an active motion, right? So I think what Tim and Claire, uh, and let me clarify. I mean, for clarification's sake, right? I'm not trying to change the motion or anything else, but from my perspective, what you're saying is that the committee would recommend to the planning commission and council that uh, the town accept the applicants uh, proposed change subject to a, a, an agreement uh, successfully negotiated between the school district and the property owner or something similar, similar to that. Is that kind of where you were going? In, in, in summary, yes. I took a crack at it in the chat. Yeah, why don't you take over Aunt, Aunt. And what, what did you have in the chat? Let's the look way at I that. phrased it was committee recommends approval of the request to change if an agreement is in place between the property and the and the school property owner and the school district when the general plan change is considered for approval. That way we give the property owner and the school district time to work it out since no actual change would happen for quite a while, as Sean made it clear earlier but we're still making it clear that the committee is really only entertaining this change if the school is a part of, of the development. Which Gene and anyone else, I'm in favor of that. I, you know, just I, uh, what I mean by that is I agree with, you know, some of the comments that I don't think we would be bending over backwards if the school wasn't part of the package. And so, um, I'm in agreement with those comments that have been made in regard to that. So Tim, is that your motion that is now up in the yellow? Or in the, or in the chat? Uh, it's it's the in yellow the chat too. <laughs> let, let, let me just review it. Um, hang on here. Yes, that, it, that's, that's a good way to phrase it. That, that is my motion. And otherwise it stays R R R A, correct? That's implied. Yes. Andreas. Andreas, can you answer that? I'm sorry, the sound broke up. Could, could you repeat the question? Jean, so can you repeat? So, so it's implied then that it's otherwise it stays R A. Yes. That implied, because we don't need to say it. Yes, because we're only considering changes or keeping what we have. I mean, the city council or the town council could make some other decision to change it to some, some other designation if, once it gets there. But the recommendation is to, has been to keep things the same unless we're specifically recommending a change. And so here we're recommending a change subject to this condition of an agreement. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we have a motion on the table. We do. It's Randy. Is there a, is there a second? That we go ahead and take the committee recommendation highlighted that we recommend approval of the requested change to RR if an agreement is in place between the property owner and school district when the general plan change is considered for approval. That is my motion. Are you seconding that motion, Randy? It looks like that's already on the table. I'm sorry, try again, Jan. I said that is the motion I think that Tim has. Are you seconding that? 
Yeah, I'm seconding that. Okay. Can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Um, Tim Anderka? Aye. Randy Elder? Yes. Jen Clark Kretz? Yes. Bonnie London? Yes. Jean Wilson? Yes. And Beth Cohen? Um, is it too late to just clarify that it's the Loomis Union School District? <laughs> No, uh, Gordon, you're on. Well, it's actually my motion. Um, yes, let's add that. Uh, I have no problem with that. Um, oh, thank you, Beth. That, that was my intention, uh, Beth. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Do we have to go back through the roll call since we amended that? Say thank you. Andreas, Andreas, do we need to go through that again? No, I, I think that clarification was what everybody meant. So I don't think we need to go through all of that again. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you taking the time that you did to really hear about this. And we're excited about what it can be. So this helps us to the direction that we can move forward. And we understand the concerns and we understand the desire, which I think is across the board, the same for all of us. So... Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the district, thank you very much. All right, gentlemen, thank you. All right, committee, are we um, are we meant to go past eight tonight? No. Okay. Um, so looks like this is a good place to stop for the evening. Um, is all are all of us in agreement on that? <laughs> yeah. The next the next scheduled meeting is on February the third. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, good job. Uh, we certainly heard a lot of, of different things tonight. Thank you very much for your time. So sorry about the internet issues. I can't wait for us to be able to meet in person again. This has been a real challenge. So thank you all for your patience. And I call this meeting adjourned. If I could just say to our attendees um, that have been patiently waiting through this, we will pick up where we left off tonight um, at map site number eight. And that would be on February 3rd, just taking it from where we left off going forward. Thank you all for being here. All right, everybody, good night. Bye.